Okay guys, so I just want to spend a couple of minutes talking about the most common problems people have with this particular assignment and hopefully explain something that will help you design your groups, users and folders. So you'll see that uh, as part of the assignment, you're asked to create users and groups and obviously you have these folders. Uh, these folders which are department folders, some managers reports and EC documents. So if you look at your assignment, you should have been should be working on this already. But if you look look at it, we're told that uh, there's uh, various departments. If we scroll down a bit, so we've got various departments: the sales and marketing, the office administration, the research and development, and the production. They're the departments. Then you've obviously got your CEO, which is not really a department. That's a just a position, really. And that's just like an exception to the to the rule here. Uh, when we're talking about developing computer and user naming convention, it's really just plain English. Okay, so if you had people who want to come into your department and they want a user account, well, you're going to name the accounts. Okay, now worksheets, we've been naming their accounts the first initial plus their last name. Okay, and obviously if we've got two people the same, uh, the system might include that we add a number after it. Okay, as long as you write that down in plain English, that's what we need. Okay, because obviously there shouldn't be a 16 different approaches because there's 16 different workers here. It should be one approach that everyone adopts. Okay, that's what the policy is. The other one is that... Um, you have a computer naming policy so there's two parts there some people forget to address the computer naming policy if you actually look at look at the example i've given you it's really the convention that's there is actually already your xx which is your initials plus the site location adl adelaide uh the function read write domain controller or file server or hyper v server or in this case workstation computer so basically, if that's already given to you in a sense, all you have to do is either use that or come up with your own strategy. And it should be just simply as saying, uh, the com all computers will be named with the two letters of my initial or something you like, uh, plus the location where they're gonna be residing in and also their function, okay? And so in, the, in this case, it's a workstation so all the computers you're probably worrying about when people join a domain could be XX, ADL is a location, it's a workstation, but not every one of them can be like that, obviously, because there's going to be maybe 200 workstations. So maybe some will be sales, some will be production, some will be uh, research and development. So maybe they're uh, adding their... Uh, what's the department they belong to as well and obviously even in each department there might be more than one workstation so maybe using numbers behind the scene okay i can tell you now here at tafe sa your naming convention for computers is that uh, if we look at the properties of this computer i can tell you now it's, it's something logical it's not just random okay it's an adl adelaide a block a 105 that's basically uh, level one room five which is the room we're in right now so you can see there's some logic behind it and then there's this random sequence of numbers that you might think is actually random but if you actually look at the sticker number on the cases of your computer you'll realize that that actually matches up with that so that's actually our asset number so that's just another system isn't it so there's a couple of easy marks okay so by just just doing a naming convention, just writing it out in plain English, you've just earned yourself a couple of marks. Okay, then it asks you to create organizational units for each department. Well, if you look at this, you've got a sales and marketing, office administration, research and development and production. Okay, easy enough to do. Uh, we create user accounts. I think everyone knows how to create that pretty easily. But it's the groups and the folders that people have problems with. First of all, let's look at the department folders. Okay, it says all work group, uh, so each work group has a folder and each work group has these permissions. Uh, obviously, the administrators of the domain have full control. Uh, the managers of that particular department, not all department managers, of that particular department to their particular folder has modified. And then the, uh, then the staff, the staff has read, write, execute, 
and list folder contents to their particular uh, department folder. So you already you should already be thinking, hey, each department has a folder, but the managers of the, that department has modified, but the workers of that department has read, write, and execute. And also, finally, we need to have AGDLP. So how do we actually do that? So let's me give you an example right now. Okay, so if I actually log into this uh, server I've got here, and we'll make this full screen. So first of all, let's open up the users and computers. And obviously, I've got a production here. Uh, let's actually create another one. We'll go research and developments. R and D is the department. Okay, research and development. So in research development, we've got some users. Uh, let me just quickly check what the users' names are. If you weren't sure, yeah, uh, just the name of some users. So if you weren't sure, you would have this document here, and in the in the appendix, it has these users okay so basically if we look at uh, look at the description of the users or the p job title position you can ha you have research assistants uh, you had uh, what's a research R&D worker and R&D manager so but really the worker and the assistants are really just all workers aren't they so it's really managers and workers so let's look at the manager it's Rachel Amory so let's create that user for her so if we actually create a user account for Rachel Emery, and I'm just creating this purely for this example, not because of anything else. Uh, and our Emery is our username, and the password is password1. So here's an example of a research, a research and development manager. So if I even want to, I'll even just make sure that's in the description. R and the manager, and uh, you can see that's R and D manager, okay? And if we look at the other person, the other person is actually, let's look at Oscar Harris, okay? So if we create another user, just an example, Oscar Harris, and O Harris is the user account. And the password is password one. Okay, I'm not obviously worrying about the home directories or whatnot at this stage because that's not what I'm trying to give the example of. Okay, obviously in the work uh, in the assignment you had to create templates, uh, home directories, all that, but that's not what I'm really uh, concerned about here in this example. So in this case, I've got a research development worker and a research development manager so they represent the two types of users uh, we are talking about for this de department so when we're talking about the agdlp it means that the uh, users are members of the global group and the global groups are member of a domain local group which is then given permissions to the folder the or the resource and then obviously that permission which goes to the domain local group gets passed on to its members which are the global groups which then get passed on to the uh to the members which are the users okay so let's start with a resource and this resource now like i said is a department folder so we're going to call it r and d r and d okay that's a resource and if this is if this is a resource for the network or people to access from the network we have to share it so we're going to go to properties sharing advanced sharing share this folder and because we understand how share permissions and ntfs permissions combine we share a full control for everyone and then every anything we give in the ntfs would be more restrictive so it would actually uh, over, override this full control so that's available so the folder name or the resource name is r d isn't it okay so the way we design our groups is first of all we create the global groups and these global groups represent the type of users okay in this case in this department we'll, call, we'll always put gg in front of it just so i know it's a global group there's a r and d manager 
isn't there? That's the type of user. And there's also a GG R and D worker or staff. Okay, so there's the two types of uh, users. So global group always represents the, the type of user. You guys over there paying attention? This is for your benefit, obviously. So obviously this Rachel Amory is a member, uh, is a manager, so she should be a member of the GG Research and Development Managers Group. Easy enough to understand so far? Okay, easy. And this Oscar Harris is a worker, so it's a member of the staff staff group. So GG R and D staff. Okay, so from this point it gets a little bit tricky. Okay, this is where people all struggle, and that's why I'm going through this right now for your benefit. Benefit. So is that uh, then we have domain local groups, but these domain local groups don't necessarily belong to any department. Okay, they're associated with the resource. So in this server, I've actually created a organizational unit just for my domain local groups. And you can do that, or you can put it uh, in your departments. It doesn't bother me for the assignment, but it just seems needed to put them all together. Because don't forget, domain local groups are not part of the department. Because I ask, I'll ask you, does the EC documents belong to any specific department? No. Okay, it's a it's a it's a location that lots of department access. So based on that philosophy, a domain local group is associated with the resource. Okay, the way I like you to do it is that I name it based on the resource. So it's a domain local group now. We go DL underscore. In this case, it's the R and D folder, wasn't it? Okay, R and D folder. I don't need to write R and D folder. I will just do R and D. So two things. It's named after the resource plus the access level. Okay, so one of the access levels I need is read, write, and execute. That was for the staff people, wasn't it? So I'll create a domain local group for the re research, and domain, uh, research and development folder resource, which I will gonna will be giving read, write, and execute. So I'll just name it like that. Done. I also need another group. Another domain local group. So if you remember, the managers need uh, need uh, modified, don't they? So I'll for that same folder. So I'm going to create another group now called read uh, the domain local read uh, research development modify. And guess what? Now I can just go here, go to members. I'm going to add who needs modify, guys. Who needs modify to the research and development folder? Yeah, so therefore the research and development manager, the global group. Done. Who needs read, write, and execute? So the research and development staff. You get getting what I'm saying, guys? Yeah, you, you're sort of getting how I'm doing it. I'm not trying to make it overcomplicated. And why do I need two levels of group? That's according to the AGDLP. And furthermore, if I believe someone else from somewhere else in the future needs also read, write, and execute to the re research and domain uh, development folder, I can just put their global group in here and they suddenly get those same rights, don't they? Yeah, so basically that's the philosophy. So if we go back to our folder now that we've already shared, now we can go to the security tab and we need to actually uh, edit the security. Okay, we all know that we, we people from outside the department shouldn't get any rights to this folder should they that's what the assignment says but this users is basically giving anyone access okay so what we have to do to remove that users is actually because it's inherited we have to disable inheritance and we'll convert what's there to be explicit permissions rather than inherited and now we get to go to the users and remove thus removing anyone else's access to this folder and now we add we add the domain local groups that we want in this case it's a research development folder right so here are the two it could be more groups than that it could be five or six different groups but in this case i've only needed the two i add those two groups and if i look at the research and development read execute and write 
I just tick the boxes according to the rights I need. And obviously for the modify, I tick modify. Even though I didn't write down, I, the name doesn't, doesn't say any of this, but we all know that when we say modify, it basically means all of that anyway. So that's just one example of one folder and one, uh, one department. But if you think about it, sales, production, aren't they basically exactly the same? So you could apply the same philosophy to all those department folders, can't you? Another one could be, uh, so if you remember, we had another folder called EC Documents. So if I create another folder called EC Docs, and again, we'll share it, first of all. So we'll share it, full control to everyone. Now, this resource is called EC Docs, isn't it? Oops, I've, <laughs> I've uh, uh, incorrectly typed there, EC Docs, okay? If you, if you actually read this, I can't I scroll this, but basically all, all groups need read, read, uh, read permissions or read, uh, execute and list permissions to this folder. But the office administration needs modified to this folder. Okay, if you read your assignment, I think that's what it says. So basically, now EC documents, like I said, doesn't belong to any specific department. So therefore, how about uh, I'll leave it in this DL group. So again, I'll create a new group. It's a domain local group. It's called DL EC Docs. I might put a underscore here just to make it um, easier to read. And you notice I've been putting underscores in spaces because obviously if you're going to do scripting in the future or command line or PowerShell, those spaces just make things a little bit harder than they need to be. Okay. So in this case, uh, we said that um, read and execute is uh, one, one of the access levels for everyone except for office administration. And uh, the office administration people get read and execute, uh, sorry, modify. So EC docs again, modify. So now you see how I've got the domain local groups for EC documents now, the ones I need, okay? I could have created more, but let's say who needs modify, oops, sorry. Who needs modify office administration people. So I don't have office administration here just yet. So I can easily just create a new OU called Office, uh, sorry, Administration. And obviously in here, I've got two types of users. We've got OA staff. Office Administration staff, and we've got a a manager don't we okay these are the two types of users so going back to the domain local groups who needs modified to the production ah uh, so not production who needs modified to ec documents not the manager office administration staff so in this case we go and find the, all the office administration staff whether the managers or users regular staff and they will be placed into this, this domain local group. Okay, who, need, who needs read access? Well, it's all the other people, isn't it? So we go and find the research and development staff and manager, production staff and manager, and the other staffs. Yeah, you get me? So you're putting all the global groups of all the different types of users into the domain local groups that has this uh, has the certain resource and access level. You sort of, you sort of make, getting, uh, making sense of that? So basically the global groups represent the types of users, the domain local groups represent the resource you're in, concerned about and the access level, okay? And now we go back to the EC docs and same as before, we can now secure it by configuring the permissions. Um, okay, so it looks like I've, uh, I, I, Looks like I've got a set of default permissions that I'm not used to, but that's okay. The ones we're concerned with is that we need the EC Docs modify and EC Docs read access. 
All right, so the read access, by default, they have read and execute and list, which is what we need. And this one, which has modify, we just have to add the modify, and you can see that actually ticks everything below it, and that's what we need. So by doing that, I've just now assigned permissions to the to the EC documents folder, and then you have other folders like the managers report. You have other resources like the printers. So for every resource, you need to create a domain local group for that resource and the different access levels. Okay. So think about that, and then you you would put the global groups, which represents the different types of users, as members of that, and then you give that domain local group the the right permissions to the resource that we just talked about, spoke about. So that's where most people most people struggle with um, this assignment. It's the design of the groups. Okay, design of the groups. Once you get the groups done, and that's why I wanted you guys to be at this stage before today's lesson uh, and uh, then I can see if you've done it right if you haven't done it right it's a chance to fix it up and move on but that's uh, some easy marks there okay so if we keep on looking forward there's a couple other things I want to I want to show you as well so here's another part which is the backups this is not anything uh, not anything t technical that you have to do on the system okay just this part it's a write-up of your plan so if I were you I'll go research you know some backup strategies maybe the generational backup strategies maybe some hardware for backing up or you can talk about the software we spoke about Windows backups we talked about backing up to the cloud we talked that talked about storing your backups and securing it so all you have to do is actually put that in a sort of a half page Write up of what you want to back up, when you're going to back up, how regularly you're going to back up, how you're going to secure the backup, where you're going to store the backup, and you get an easy mark for that one. Then on the on the server itself, you actually configure a scheduled backup, so it actually backs up automatically at a certain time, and that's fairly straightforward. Here's another part, the part 10 research. Again, it's an easy mark. All these ones which are write ups are pretty easy mark. It just takes a bit of time to find the information and to to write it, write it up. In this case, it's talking about sites. Okay, it's talking about the benefits of having a site. So what you have to do is basically create what's called an executive summary, explain what sites are. Okay, and um, and probably just explain some of the advantages of having a site. Okay, so basically here's that's some general feedback. So hopefully addresses some of the common things that people don't get the marks for. So don't forget, you don't have to get 100% for this. All you have to do is get 70% of all the, these tech checkboxes. I think that's about 22 of these checkboxes ticked. And the way you would present this to me is that you would create screenshots and place it into the areas where it's asked you to do these things. And obviously that makes it easy for me to see if the screenshots match up with what the requirements are. are. And don't forget, I'm not looking for step-by-step -step, yeah, screenshots of how you got there. I'm really after uh, I'm really after just the, the final result that shows me that you've done it correctly. So if you want to think about it, if you were the lecturer and someone said, I know how to do this, here's my example, is what you're showing or what the student's showing enough to say that you've done it correctly? All right, so that's where we'll leave this today.